All right, today we're going to be talking about when Jesus wasn't very nice, which doesn't sound like a very encouraging Sunday morning topic. But Jesus sometimes seemed a little uh, harsh. I don't know, sometimes Jesus pokes us. I think we could probably all agree with that. Because it's raining. No, it's not. It's just raining. It's just raining. Ow! It's just raining. It's okay. It's raining. You poked my heart. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you poked my heart. Sometimes Jesus pokes our heart. Sometimes, and that's a good thing. Jesus will convict us. Jesus will help us see that, oh, we shouldn't have been so mean, or, oh, we shouldn't have told that lie, or, oh, we really shouldn't have done that. And that's good. Jesus wants to get our attention. But if we don't respond to a gentle poking on the chest, a gentle poking on the heart, sometimes Jesus seems to poke people right in the eye. And when we're reading the story, sometimes we just kind of read through it and don't really think about it. But if we were in those stories, if we were these guys, well, we would feel like Jesus was kind of not being very nice in those circumstances. Now, I put nice in quotes because obviously Jesus is beyond nice. But being beyond nice, being loving, doesn't always mean being nicey-nice. It means having the, the love for someone to tell them what they need to hear sometimes, not just what they want to hear. And Jesus would do that. Now, why is this important to us? Why do we care if Jesus was nice or not? Well, even though Jesus isn't here with us, physically here with us today, we want, I mean, if Jesus is going to get tough with someone, we just assume it don't be us, right? We just assume it be somebody else. Good for us to see what annoys Jesus. Good for us to see what Jesus does not appreciate so that we can get rid of those things in our lives, right? Because we could be think we could think we're doing fine. We could just be sitting around enjoying our life, and then Jesus may uh, kind of start closing doors in front of us, and we think, well, "What's wrong? I thought everything was good, Jesus. I thought everything was fine." But sometimes Jesus will put us in the dark just to kind of wake us up. Poor little kitty, just minding his own business, sitting in a box the way all kitties do, sit in a box. And the other little kitty thought, oh, what a nice little box for me to stand on top of and then sit on top of. Who knows how long that kitty was in that poor little box. But sometimes we think we're doing fine and Jesus may have to show us that we're in the dark. We're going to look at three different circumstances where Jesus didn't seem very nice. This week, we're just going to focus on number one. We'll do number two and number three in the next coming weeks. But Jesus wasn't very nice when it came to lukewarm followers, people who said they follow Jesus, people who said they wanted to serve Jesus, but they really weren't, you know, all in. Number two, Jesus wasn't very nice when it came to lightweight faith. And number three, Jesus wasn't very nice when it came to loathsome fakers. Hopefully none of us are loathsome fakers, but we'll talk about that in a couple weeks. First, Jesus wasn't very nice when it came to lukewarm followers. Specifically, you can see Jesus getting pretty, uh, uh, I don't want to say snippy, but pretty harsh, pretty straightforward with people who weren't willing to serve and those who weren't willing to sacrifice. People who said, oh, I'll pray a prayer with you, Jesus. You know, I'll, I'll even pray every night or when I eat. You know, before I go to sleep, I'll pray that you'll keep me safe because it's all about me. I'll even go to church on Sundays, but I'm really not going to jump in with all four feet. I'm really not willing to really serve you and really sacrifice for you. First of all, those who weren't willing to serve, we talked about this a lot last week. For those of you who were here last week, we talked about how serious Je Jesus takes our service to him. He takes it very seriously, and we should too. So I won't spend a lot of time on these first few passages, but for those of you who weren't here, I didn't want to jip you, you know. And for those of you who are here, I didn't want you to fall asleep. So I'll, I'll try to keep, you, keep it moving. Matthew 8, 18, when Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Then a teacher of the law came to him and he said, Teacher, I'll follow you anywhere you go. That sounds good, right? I mean, Jesus came to this earth to get followers. Jesus came to this earth, so not just for the sake of followers, but people who would believe that he is who he said he is, the son of God and God the son, and a teacher of the law, someone who had invested in learning the Torah, learning the law, learning the scriptures of that day, and who were invested in teaching that law. And he said, Jesus, I will follow you anywhere. And Jesus, I mean, what would we expect Jesus to say? 
Oh, thank you. I'm so glad you're willing to follow me. Oh, I'm so glad you're willing to see that there's more to it than just the Old Testament scriptures. Oh, you're, we're in for a bumpy road. Don't think it's going to be a bed of roses, but hang in there with me and we'll be okay. This is how Jesus answered him in verse 20. Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. That seems like kind of a, a non-encouraging response. Instead of just saying, yeah, come on with me. Okay, we may have a few rough nights. He's basically saying, you know what? Are you really willing to serve me? Are you really willing to follow me? You know, it's not all going to be glamorous. You know, I don't even have a, a, a place to stay at night. Well, not the most encouraging response he could have given. Look at verse 21. Another disciple, you know, a disciple is, is a follower. That teacher of the law in this next guy we're going to read about, these weren't guys who just showed up in, to listen to Jesus one time. These aren't people who just showed up to church one time. These are people who came to church, followed Jesus Week after week after week, they were disciples. They were followers. Another disciple said to him, Lord, I'll follow you, but first let me go bury my father. Well, that sounds like a responsible thing to do, doesn't it? Sounds like a compassionate thing to do. Now, as we talked about last week, the father probably wasn't dead yet. The father was probably old, sick. We figured he wasn't going to last much longer, kind of like Tony. You know, he was probably old, and he probably said, Lord, I will follow you. But, you know, first things first, my dad's sick and I need to take care of him. That sounds like a great response. It sounds like Jesus would say, you know, I, I understand. You know, I want you to honor your father. I want you to take care of your father. What did Jesus say to him? Uh, where am I? Oh, he said, let me go bury my father. In verse 22, Jesus told him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Sounds like Jesus woke up on the wrong side of the bed or something. It doesn't sound like he was in a very good mood. But bear with him. Bear with me. Jesus knew these guys. And he, he loved them enough to tell them what they needed to hear, not what they wanted to hear. Although we all want encouragement, sometimes we need to recognize, okay, everything's not okay. Or we need to recognize our own condition and say, you know, I'm not as willing to follow Jesus as I thought I was. Look at this next verse. Uh, this is Luke 9, 61. Still another said to him, I will follow you, Lord. But first, let me just go back and say bye to my family. Well, that sounds reasonable too, doesn't it? I mean, otherwise, maybe mom and dad are going to call the police and do a missing, uh, missing persons report. Maybe they're going to think you were abducted or that you got taken away by aliens. Let me just go back and say bye to my family. Now, trust me, we are not more gracious than Jesus. Jesus knew these guys. Jesus knew his heart. Maybe he was just making an excuse saying, you know, let me go pray about it, Jesus. Uh, you know what, let me go back home and see what the family says. And if the family says it's okay, maybe I'll come follow you. Jesus knew what was in his heart. Jesus replied in verse 62, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Can you imagine saying, Jesus, I'm gonna, I want to follow you. And him saying, you're not worthy of following me. That's why we're going over this this morning. We don't want Jesus to feel like we're not worthy of following him. Now, are any of us really worthy? No, we're not. But we should have our heart in the right place, and we should recognize that serving Jesus isn't just a matter of praying a prayer. Serving Jesus isn't just a matter of, you know, hey, I'll do kids' church once a month. or You know, it, all those things are good. But serving Jesus means turning our whole heart and our whole life over to Jesus. Serving Jesus isn't, okay, I'll, I'll serve Jesus, but on my time and on my terms, which is what it looked like these guys were saying. We shouldn't try to serve Jesus on our terms and in our time. Now, this next one's hard because I think most of the time we just don't recognize it. We shouldn't let good things distract us from God's things because usually we think good things are God's things. Now, should we be good to family? You can talk to me. Should we be good to family? Yes. Should we honor and respect our mother and father, whether they were good mother and fathers or not? Yes, we should. We should be compassionate. We should be considerate. We should be responsible. We should be all of those things. But we can't let anything get in our way of following Jesus. And sometimes we think we're being compassionate to the next guy or considerate of the next guy. Well, well, I, I would go to church, but, you know, my family's Catholic and they might get offended. So I, I really, I, I'm trying to be respectful of my mother and father. That, that's, not, that's not right. That's putting our family above following Jesus Christ. 
oh, I would get baptized, but, you know, my, fa my family doesn't really understand. So, you know, God understands. I'll follow him in my heart, but I, I, I can't really follow him by getting baptized. That's putting our family, that's putting consideration, which is normally a good thing, but it's not God's thing. We can't put those things above following him. Does that make sense? Responsibility is good. Uh, healthy relationships are good. Compassion, consideration, it's all good. We just can't let it get above God's word and following him. Jesus wasn't very nice when it came to lukewarm followers. Again, those who weren't willing to really serve, really willing to jump in with all four feet. Also, those who weren't willing to sacrifice. Look at Matthew 19, starting in verse 16. Just then a man came up to Jesus and said, Jesus, uh, he said, teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Isn't that a great question? Don't you wish people would come up to you and say, Oh, whatever you have, I want. How do I get saved like you did? How do I get to know God like you did? Again, that's why Jesus came to this earth, so that people would come to know him. And someone's coming up to him saying, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? What would you answer, by the way? You know, I mean, think about it. You don't have to say it. But have faith in Jesus. Believe that Jesus came to this earth and died on the cross for your sins and say, Uncle, Admit that you're a sinner, believe that he's God, and commit your life to him. Those are the ABCs we do in kids' church. Admit, believe, commit. It's easy to remember. I won't charge you extra for that. Okay, maybe five bucks. Admit, believe, commit. What would you tell them? Those are all good things. He asked a very straightforward question. You would expect Jesus to give him a pretty straightforward answer. Look at what Jesus said. Why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good. Was, he, was Jesus denying that he was good? No, but it sounds like kind of a weird response. Jesus was helping those man's eyes open up to see, wow, he's not just a teacher. There's only one who's truly good, and that's God. Wow, Jesus really is God. He's not just a good teacher. He's not just a prophet. He's God in the flesh. Jesus understood this guy needed to understand more. It's not just a matter of praying a prayer. It's a matter of really giving your life to Jesus Christ. But then he said, if you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Now tell me, is that how you get saved? By following the law. Don't mess up. Follow the law 100%. And if you follow the law 100%, you're going to go to heaven? No, that's not how we get saved. Why would Jesus say something like that? Well, we'll see more of the passage, but I think sometimes, don't we need to recognize that we're sinners before we feel like we need a Savior? Don't we need to recognize we're drowning before we'll say help? You know, maybe this guy thought he was a little too self-righteous, and maybe Jesus was saying, hey, do you even follow the laws? Do you recognize you're even a sinner? I think this next verse would have been a red flag even to me. The guy answered, which ones? Jesus said, just follow the rules. Which ones do I really have to follow? Hmm. I don't know. I think I have a little insight into this guy, too. Then this is funny. I don't know if Jesus was being sarcastic, but he just started. He didn't, like, go through the Ten Commandments. Okay, commandment number one. Do you want me to do it again? I do want you to do in kids' church. If you have any kids in kids' church, ask them the Ten Commandments. I guarantee you they know it better than you do. Well, I shouldn't guarantee you that, but I bet you they know it better than you do. The first commandment is serve God alone. There's one God, only one. The second commandment, don't bow down to idols. That's one guy bowing down, down to an idol. Number three, watch your words. Don't use the Lord's name in vain. So that's like a W like word and you're putting it over your mouth. Don't use the Lord's name in vain. Number four, keep the Sabbath holy. Number five, honor your mother and father. Number six, yeah, you're honoring them, otherwise you're going to get spanked. I just like to do that. <laughs> Number six, do not commit murder. Number seven, a husband and wife should walk faithfully. Don't commit adultery. But that's the way we say it to the kids. A husband and wife should honor the marriage and walk faithfully. Number eight, eight. You see how I'm doing number six? Number seven. Number eight, do not steal. Number nine, do not bear false testimony. Don't bear false witness. Number 10, do not covet. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Those are the Ten Commandments. Well, Jesus, when, when this guy said, well, which commandments do I, have to pit, do I have to follow? He said, hey, how about number six? 
Don't commit murder. Eh, while we're on it, how about don't commit adultery, number seven? Uh, what's the next one? You shall not steal, number eight. Don't bear false testimony, number nine. And how about love your neighbor as yourself? Wait, which one was that? One, two, three. Which one was love your neighbor as yourself? It wasn't in there. It wasn't in there. God, now how many laws does God have? Ten? You just have to follow those ten laws? God has a lot of laws. But love your neighbor as yourself isn't in the Ten Commandments. It is in Leviticus. It's all over the Bible. It's the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law. And Jesus just started naming some commandments and threw that one in there. Maybe to open the guy's eyes. Maybe to open the guy. Now, how many of us really love each other as much as we love ourselves? Really? You know? Some guy wants to get in front of you and you go, oh, of course, let me slow down and let you go. We go, mm, mm, he's not getting in front of me. Mm. How many of us really look out for the other guy before ourselves, really? So maybe this was, a, a, the, again, an opportunity for the guy. Jesus trying to get the guy to open up his eyes. You don't really love other people as much as you love yourself. And then what did the man say? All of these I've kept. I've done all of these things since I was a kid. Psh. What do I still lack? He still recognized, you got to give him credit. He still recognized he lacked something. There was some hole there that he just couldn't fill with all of his stuff and all of his activities. Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go and sell your possessions and give it to the poor. Then you'll have treasure in heaven and then follow me. Now, is that how we become perfect by selling our house and selling our car and giving all our money to the poor? Is that how we become perfect? No, but Jesus saw something in this guy that was holding him up. Something in this guy's life that he was keeping above the scripture. Something he wasn't willing to sacrifice to follow Jesus. So what did the guy say when he heard this? That's easy. That's just money. I can make more money. I want eternal life. Give me eternal life. I'll sacrifice everything for you, Jesus. What did he say? When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. And then Jesus said to his disciples, truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now we may wonder why Jesus wasn't more gentle in these situations. I mean, Jesus could have just said, dude, you have a problem with money. And you need to recognize that you have a problem with money before you can follow me. But Jesus sometimes wants us to figure it out. Jesus wants us to look at ourselves in the mirror of God's word and say, Wow, I'm a selfish son of a gun. Wow, I am like prideful and arrogant. And I mean, not me, but maybe it's Tony we're looking in the... I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. He wants us to kind of think it through a little bit and figure it out and not have to be spoon-fed everything. And Jesus loves people enough to tell them what they need to hear. And sometimes, I mean, you guys know, sometimes people are willing to listen when you tell them very gently. And sometimes it's like you tell them gently and they don't listen. And you tell them gently and they don't listen. And sometimes you just got to pop them upside the head just so they can listen. I think that's what this kitty cat had in mind. Hello. Won't you please play with me? Please. Will you give me a little attention? I just want to talk to you. (laughs) Sometimes people won't pay attention to a gentle approach, and if not, then you have to tell them what they need to hear, even if it means popping them upside the head. (laughs) All right, let's look at Luke 14, 25, another example where Jesus wasn't apparently nice, evidently nice when it came to people who weren't willing to sacrifice. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus. That's a good thing, right? I mean, we want a big church, not because we want a big church, but that means lots of people are hearing God's word. That's why Jesus came. Large crowds are following Jesus. And he turns around and says to them some great, encouraging, uplifting word. He turns around and he says to them in verse 26, If anyone comes to me and doesn't hate his father and his mother, his wife and his children, his brothers and his sisters, yes, even his own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. That's harsh. Now, we can't take one passage, or we shouldn't take one passage, and then take it out and say, oh, see, I'm supposed to hate my father. 
That's why I hate you, Dad, because Jesus told me to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can hate my wife because Jesus told me to. Does Jesus want us to hate our wives? No. Just in case there was any misunderstanding, that one would be the hardest one. Does Jesus want us to hate our kids? No. Does Jesus want us to hate our mother and our father? No. He's told us all through Scripture how to take care of our family and how we ought to honor and respect and sacrifice for our family. We know that's not what he's saying. But look at, look at verse 34. He said, don't suppose I've come to bring peace to the earth. I didn't come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a father-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Now, he said all of that, to I think, to get people's attention, to get them just like you guys got really quiet. <gasps> For everyone to go, what? Jesus, what? I'm supposed to hate my kids? What? What? And he got them all on their little tippy toes listening. And then he said, Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or their daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And taking up their cross, that wasn't a pretty gold chain with a little cross on a necklace. That was a, like an electric chair. He's basically, basically saying, if you love your life more than you love me, just stay home. You don't, you don't need to fake it. You don't need to just show up every now and then. You don't need to follow me. You're not worthy of me. He's not saying that to be mean. He's saying that because he wants us to see we shouldn't serve Jesus on our terms and on our time. We ought to jump in with all four feet. If, if he's saying anything, did I finish? Yeah, if he's saying anything, he's saying that this Christian life, if we really do it right, it's not going to be easy. And better for him to tell us up front than for us to have to figure it out on our own. If this Christian life is really done right, it's going to take service. It's going to take sacrifice. There aren't usually shortcuts, unfortunately, to this Christian life. We can't always figure out an easy way to do it so that we can play it safe. The dog really wants the ball, but really doesn't want to jump in the water. I don't know if that's one lazy dog or one really smart dog. <laughs> All right, that's one really smart dog. But in this Christian life, we have to be willing to jump in with all four feet. We want to serve God. We can't just kind of play around and sprinkle a little religion on our life. If we really want eternal life, we've got to jump in the pool and accept what that means. Serving God and sacrificing for God on his terms, not ours. Jesus finished up this, uh, his talk to these people by saying, whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. That's why he was so harsh with them to get them to open up their eyes to recognize, look, if you are so concerned about holding on to your own life, holding on to your own comforts, holding on to your own cash, even holding on to your own finances or your family, if you're so concerned about those things more so than following me, you're, you're going to lose. You're going to miss out. But if you're just willing to sacrifice, if you're willing to lose your life and all of its comforts for my sake, then you'll find it. Again, another passage showing that Jesus wasn't very, quote-unquote, nice when it comes to, follow, to uh, lukewarm followers. Look at Revelation chapter 3, verse 15. I know your deeds, he said, that you're neither hot nor cold. Have you ever noticed that it's easier to witness to somebody who is like, they know they're bad, they know they're sinners, they know they don't deserve God, they know they're kind of in the wrong place in their life? You don't have to convince them that they're sinners. It's easier to talk to people that are just kind of cold against the Lord versus people who think they're okay. I go to church every now and then. I pray. I believe in God. That's enough. You're all holier than thou. Just because you start going to that church, you think that you're all that and I'm so bad. I'm fine. It's hard to talk to people who sprinkle a little religion on their life because they think they're okay. 
God is saying, you know what? I wish you were just cold against me or you were just hot on fire for me. I wish you were one or the other. He said, but because you're lukewarm, you're not hot or cold, I think I'll just spit you out of my mouth. What an awful thought. We don't want Jesus to want to spit us out of our mouth. We don't want to be following Jesus and for him to turn around and say, why are you following me? Uh, 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 you just, just, why don't you just go home? We don't want to put ourselves in a position like that. So we're learning this so that we can make sure that we live a life of service and sacrifice that's worthy of following Jesus. So that when people look at us, they know that we're Jesus followers. Jesus wants us to be serious about following him. If we're not really willing to sacrifice and we're not really willing to serve, we're really not going to put a smile on his face. And what has Tony said so many times, the whole point of what we do, the whole point of what every single thing we do should be to make God grin, to make God happy, to make God look at our decision and say, yeah, even if everybody else laughs at us. You know, you're one of the guys who doesn't go for a beer after work and everybody laughs at you. Jesus drank wine. You can't have a beer with us. Everybody laughs at you and you say, I want to honor God with my decision. And God says, yeah. Everybody else goes to the casino after work, and you say, no, nah, you know, I don't know. I just want to, I don't want to get into that. You know, I really want to honor God with my dishonor. You say, I'm not honoring God just because I'm throwing a couple of dice. That's dishonoring to God. Everybody else makes fun of you, and you feel like, you know, I want to honor God. I want to do this. This is how I feel like I can honor God. And you want God to look down at you and say, yes, that's awesome. That's what we should want in our life. Jesus wasn't very nice when it came to lukewarm followers. This is our behavior. Are we really serious? Next week, we're going to talk about our beliefs and our being, who we are as people. But this is our behavior. Are we really serious in how we live this life? Are we saved? Are we soaked? Are we serious? We talk about it all the time, but that's what Jesus told the disciples. Jesus died, was resurrected, came back, and out of everything he could have told them, he said, go into all the world and what? What was the first thing he told them? Make disciples. That means get them saved. And then he said, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Which one is that? Saved, soaked, or serious? Soaked. Get get them saved. Get them soaked. Go into the world and make disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. Get them serious. That means our behavior. Are we really committed to living this Christian life? If so, we're going to look different. We just will. We have to accept it. We're going to look like odd people because we are. Well, you are. I'm kind of normal. We're going to look like crazy people because that's what Jesus' followers look like. But are we really committed to that? When the world is watching, can they see our commitment to who we need to be? This isn't as bad as it looks. It's a hyena that looks, goes to what looks like a dead deer. And yet, things may not finish as we thought they would. For sometimes the weak are capable of cunning dissimulation. I know it looks awful, sorry. The hyena goes to chase the leopard away. Ha <laughs> ha! <laughs> you know I'm not going to show some poor little animal getting eaten. When the world is watching, can they see our commitment to be who we really need to be. That deer was committed to be whoever that deer needed to be to not get eaten. We want to be committed to be whoever we need to be to make God grin, to make him happy. And that's going to show. So evaluate yourself. Evaluate your life. Am I really showing the fruit of God's spirit in my life? Am I so distracted by the good things in my life that I'm missing out on the godly things? And I think, honestly, in a church like this, in a church in America, anyone in this country, we're so distracted by the good things, the responsible things. Again, I'm guilty. Think about our own working hours, our awake hours. What do we do? We get up, we get breakfast, or we make something for the kids, we get them ready for school, or we go to work. We do all good and responsible things. We work hard all day. We come home, we make dinner, we watch a little TV, we go to bed. Where are we going? We're like little hamsters on a wheel just running in circles and Satan is just laughing. They think they're going so far. They think they're accomplishing something in this world. They've got these 70 or 80 years or 100 years, I don't know, all these years in front of them. 
And they're just going to keep walking in circles, running in circles like little hamsters. We want to get off that hamster wheel and say, stop. Jesus, how do you want me to serve you? How do you want me to sacrifice for you? And I don't know necessarily what the answer in your life is going to be, but we should be willing to do anything, to go anywhere, to sacrifice anything. The last thing we need to do, and unfortunately the first thing I think we do do, is we just sprinkle a little God on our lives. We sprinkle a little Jesus on our lives. We go to church, which is good. We pray, which is good. But that doesn't make us godly. We ought to be able to look at ourselves like Jesus kept trying to get those guys to do. We need to look at the mirror of what we look like, our reflection in God's word, and say, wow, I need to be so much more. I want to be so much more just to make him happy. That's what it's all about. Make sure you're saved. Make sure you've given your life to Jesus Christ. Not go to church, not been baptized, not do all sorts of Christian things. When have we really become Christians? There's a, there has to be a time and a place in your life where you say, uncle, where you say, Jesus, I'm going to follow you. I don't even know exactly what that means, but I'm going to follow you anywhere and really mean it. Not on your terms, not on your time, but really mean it. If, you don't, if you're not certain you've done that, if you can't think back and say, man, I was 19 years old, or, oh, wow, that was about three months ago. If you can't look back and kind of know when you gave your life to Jesus Christ, make sure you've done it. It doesn't matter how long you've believed in God. It doesn't matter how many years you've gone to church. When have you given your life to Jesus Christ? That's what it's all about. If you're not sure, ask any one of us, hey, have you given your life to Jesus Christ? What did you do? How did you do it? Or if you don't want to talk to anybody, grab one of the blue books. There's nothing magic in the blue book, but it does walk you through the gospel. It walks you through the kind of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I say kind of because it doesn't necessarily walk you through every little step, but it basically explains that you are a sinner. Duh. It basically explains that we're sinners, that Jesus is God, that he came to this earth, he led the perfect life that we couldn't live, He was willing to pay the penalty for our sins by being crucified on the cross. He was buried. He rose from the dead after three days to prove to the world that he is who he said he is, the Son of God and God the Son. What are we going to do about it? Are we willing to give our life to him? That's what this explains. But you don't need a blue book. I just explained it. You can just say right now, Jesus, I give up. Jesus, save me. Jesus, forgive me. He's offering you this free gift, but if you don't take it, it doesn't count. You can believe it all day long, but if you haven't received it, it doesn't work. Does that make sense? That's what it means to get saved. Then get baptized. Any one of you who says, I'm saved, I've given my life to Jesus Christ, but I'm not going to get baptized. I don't want to get my hair wet. You know, I I don't want people to see me. You know, I don't know. I have family that wouldn't really understand. Then... I'm sorry, but it looks like Jesus is probably not going to be very happy because we're not really willing to sacrifice for him. We're not really willing to serve him. We say, Jesus, I'll follow you, but only so far. That's not how Jesus wants us to be. Get saved, get soaked, and then get serious about living your life for Jesus Christ. That's how one day we're all going to stand before him. And that should bring excitement to our hearts, but that should also bring a little bit of fear because we're going to have to stand before him and give an account of our lives to him. Hey, I went to work every single day that I had a job. Okay, most of the days, you know, sometimes I was sick and I I went to school and I tried kind of hard, but, you know, it's school. Who tries really hard? And, okay, I I wasn't really mean to people and I did more good things than bad things. What are we going to say when we stand before Jesus Christ? I got distracted by life a lot, and I'm sorry, Lord, but I really wanted to serve you. I really tried to serve you. I was really willing to sacrifice before you. None of us are worthy, but when we accept Jesus Christ, he washes away all of our sins so that hopefully every single one of us will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what we want to hear, right? All right, let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you give us an opportunity every day that we wake up. We have a new opportunity to follow you. God, your word says that your mercy, your grace is new every single morning. God, thank you for that. God, if we're still alive, we know that you still have something planned for us. You're not finished with us yet. God, I pray that every single day we would just remember that you put us on this earth for a reason. And it's not just to do good things. It's to do godly things. It's to become more and more like Jesus 
and then help other people become more and more like Jesus. That's what we're really here for. God, please remind us of that every single day. God, please help us look for opportunities every day to shine your light, to represent you well, even if people make fun of us. God, help us understand that nothing in this life should come between our relationships with you. Nothing should come. We shouldn't love anything more than we love you. We shouldn't follow anybody or anything more than we follow you. We love you. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your grace. Help us become more and more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.